Uh, this is Gary Powers Jr. I'd highly recommend that you listen to Cold War Conversations. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. <laughs> This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Fünf, zwei, sieben, eins, sechs, sechs, neun, acht, acht, drei. Well, who is our first letter from today, Edward? Uh, an old friend of yours, Doris Bryan Hartley of Thornton the Field, asking what's being done to build up Anglo-Soviet relations. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode 23 of Cold War Conversations. Today's episode is the first in a new partnership we have formed with the Cold War Museum in the United States. We speak with Gary Powers Jr., whose father piloted the U-2 spy plane shot down over the Soviet Union. Powers U-2 was shot down on May 1st, 1960, as he flew over Soviet airspace, and after parachuting out of the plane, he was captured and convicted of espionage. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but was freed on February the 10th, 1962, in exchange for Soviet spy Rudolf Abel. The incident and exchange was detailed in the Steven Spielberg film Bridge of Spies. Now, before we start, I would again like to thank all of those who are supporting the podcast with monthly pledges via Patreon. It is very much appreciated and will allow us to expand the scope of the podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast further and get access to some exclusive extras, then go to our website at coldwarconversations.com and use the Patreon link on the homepage. Thanks to our latest Patreon, Matt Evans, and also Mark Silito, who has used our new facility for one-off donations via PayPal at paypal.me slash Cold War Conversations. So, back to today's episode, and a warm welcome to Gary Powers Jr., Hi, Gary. Thank you very much for uh, joining Cold War Conversations. Oh, well, thank you, Ian, for having me on. Not a problem. Delighted to have you on. So um, I'm familiar with, uh, you know, your, your father's name in, in Cold War history and some aspects of the, um, the, the U2 incident. But um, when, when were you first aware that your dad was famous? Well, growing up in the household, I was always aware that my father had been shot down over the Soviet Union, imprisoned by the KGB, and then ultimately exchanged for a Soviet spy. But as a kid, I thought this was normal. I thought everybody's dad went through something like this. <laughs> and it wasn't really until uh, his death uh, in August of 1977 that I became aware of his role in history. Uh, up until that point in time, I just thought it was normal. I just didn't know anything different. After he passed away, that's when the light bulb came on. That's when I realized that not everybody's dad gets shot down, imprisoned, exchanged, buried at Arlington Cemetery, or shrouded in controversy. Right. And and how you know how did your classmates treat you around that? Were they, were they aware of the story, or did they suddenly become aware when when your father passed away? Um, in, in grade school up until sixth grade, I, I never, um, I don't know if my other peers were aware of what was going on with dad or not. I know that my father came in one year in sixth grade and gave a talk to the school and I'm sure that, you know, Oh, Hey dad, uh, uh, Gary, that's your dad. But I don't really remember the uh, details of his talk to the students. I mean, I was just flattered that dad was up there, probably a little embarrassed that dad was up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. then after his death, uh, when I'm in high school, seventh grade through 12th grade, 
um, for the most part, it was, it was a normal high school, a normal uh, education. Um, there was that uh, stigma of, you know, dad being who was he, who he was. Yeah. But at the same time, I went to a high school in L.A., California, where other celebrity kids or pol- politician kids or actor kids would be um, in attendance. Yeah. OK. OK. So um, now when your father was flying the U-2, he wasn't technically part of the uh, Air Force, was he? So when, when what was his sort of like military career? Well, and this is where it gets a little tricky. You have to uh, talk about it either in the 1960 context or you have to talk about it in the, ni- in the 2010 context. Um, in 1960, uh, the early fifth, the mid 50s, when the U2 program was developed, it was a CIA program. It was a clandestine operation headed by a civilian agency, intentionally headed by a civilian agency. Because if it had been headed by the military, General LeMay, the U.S. Air Force, it would have been an act of war to fly over a foreign hostile country yeah. um, by a military plane and a military pilot. But if it was a civilian plane and a civilian pilot, then it would be an act of espionage. So in the 1950s, when these U-2 flights were taking place, it was a civilian operation. The pilots were taken out of the military. Uh, they uh, resigned their commission. They were civilian status, but they had uh, the program had help from logistically from the U.S. Air Force, the fuel, the air bases, the personnel uh, that were doing the weather and or the plot coordinates uh, would have been a mixture of CIA and U.S. Air Force personnel. Right. Then. So that was that was a, a joint operation. That jointness came out in a declassified conference in 1998 that showed it was a joint military civilian operation that one could not exist without the other. And at that time in 2008, uh, I mean, in 1998, when that was declassified, that opened up the door for my father to be posthumously awarded with some military medals. It counted his CIA time as military time. Right. But that didn't happen until the mid uh, 1990s. Okay. Okay. And what was the, the cover story for the, for the flights, you know, for, for this sort of um, fake civilian organization? Yes, uh, it, was the, it was a U-2. Uh, it yeah. was a weather research plane. It was designed to fly at uh, high elevations to do air samples uh, and to do uh, different atmospheric tests. Right. And that was the general cover story that followed it uh, from the beginning but certain people within like Aviation Week uh, and or um, other aviation publications often read between the lines and guessed at some other things they might be doing with that plane. Right. OK. And what specific training did your father have for these missions? And, and what was his training in the event of a malfunction or a, or a landing in the Soviet Union as well? Well, uh, the uh, early U-2 pilots were trained at Area 51 in the Nevada desert. Uh, They were then assigned around different air bases uh, surrounding the Soviet Union, and they were from Alaska to Greece, Turkey, Japan, Korea, um, to do these flights. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dad's uh, particular May 1st flight uh, took off from Peshawar, Pakistan on May 1st of 60. Uh, Prior to that flight, he had done 27 missions Uh, over and or around the former Soviet Union. On May 1st, um, he's the uh, one of the pilots with the most number of hours, the most number of experience. Uh, He's selected to do this May 1st flight to fly across the entire width of the former Soviet Union. Now, on this particular mission, my dad is shot down. Uh, He's hit by the near miss of a Soviet SA-2 missile uh, within the central part of the former Soviet Union. And you asked about what pilots were to do if, if capture was eminent or if they were to go down. Yeah. Um, the uh, misinformation of the time uh, indicate, indicates that my father disobeyed orders, that he, he did not uh, uh, hit the destruct button, that he did not commit suicide, uh, that he uh, even may have landed the plane intentionally. There was all this misinformation circulating around. Mm-hmm. In regards to what the orders uh, were given to the pilots, I'm going to paraphrase. Pilots are perfectly free to tell the truth about their missions and what they were doing 
aka photographing territory. Yeah. They are not to talk about specifications of the equipment on board the airplane. Um, they are to uh, appear to cooperate, uh, but uh, they should not uh, reveal uh, information that they know is sensitive. And basically, my father followed his orders to the T. But what complicates this is that uh, pilots were given the option of taking a quote-unquote suicide device with them on these missions. It was explained to the pilots that, hey, if you're caught, you will be tortured. Here is a way to alleviate the pain and suffering. It was an optional device to take and an optional device to use in the event of a torture. Yeah. So when my father ends up alive, uh, but uh, they have found this poison tipped needle on him, uh, Khrushchev uh, brags to the uh, world population going, oh, look at these evil Americans, what they give their spy pilots to commit suicide with. This one wanted to see to live another day. Um, and from that moment on, dad was ordered to commit suicide, that he had disobeyed orders. Uh, that is part of the misinformation. Uh, the device was given to the pilots at their option to take or to use in the event of torture. Otherwise, they would not have given the pilots instructions on what to do if captured. Right. Okay. And and how did your father describe his capture? Because he parachuted out of the um, the aircraft after the uh, the near miss from the SAM, yeah? Correct. Uh, after the near miss, dad falls from 70,000 feet to 30,000 feet within the cockpit, being banged around, centrifugal force, the wings have broken off, it's tumbling out of the sky. Um, he can't use the ejection seat. Uh, instead, he re does the following. He opens up the canopy, uh, he undoes his harness, he sucked up halfway out of the cockpit. He's still connected by his air hose. Now, in this uh, configuration, he can no longer hit the destruct button on the cockpit dashboard. He's getting closer to the ground. He breaks free of the air hose. He falls free of the airplane. His parachute opens automatically at 15,000 feet. He parachutes down to the ground. Uh, upon landing uh, on the outskirts of a collective farm, he's rounded up by the uh, local farmers, uh, some local officials. Uh, they take him to the uh, central part of town. And there he's basically asked some basic questions by someone who speaks broken English. And they ask him uh, about three or four hours worth of questions, you know, general, who are you? Where are you from? What are you doing here? Yeah. Um, and then the KGB show up uh, that afternoon evening, take him by armed guard and transport plane to Moscow's airport, then shuttle him over to Lubyanka prison. Okay. Okay. And I understand that um, a Soviet aircraft was shot down at the same time. Is that correct? Because I think your father saw another parachute, didn't he? Yes, that is correct. Um, on May 1st, uh, when my father was shot down, they were trying to do anything they could to uh, get the intruder. Uh, there were MiGs that were scrambled to try to uh, intercept the plane, but they could not reach the U-2 at its height. Mm -hmm. There was an Su-9 uh, that could reach the height, but could not sustain level flight at that altitude. Uh, it was ordered to try to ram the U-2. It missed. Uh, missiles were fired. And during the um, uh, confusion of battle, the, 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 the stress, the anxiety, all the stuff being uh, broadcast back and forth trying to get this intruder, uh, the Soviets shot down one of their own MiGs. It was piloted by a, a gentleman by the name of Sergei Safronov. Um, he died as a result of the friendly fire. Uh, I had the privilege of talking to his son a few years back. And as a result of that conversation, when I was in Sverdlovsk in December of 2017, I laid flowers down at the uh, memorial to the MiG pilot there where the plane wreckage crashed. I thought it was very important to show my respect uh, wow. for the other fighter pilot uh, on May 1st. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Th thanks for sharing that. I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't known that, that level of detail. Um, uh, what information have you got about how your father was interrogated when he was held in the Lubyanka? Mm -hmm. Well, um, according to my father, what he wrote in his book, uh, what my research indicates, uh, the first seven days of his interrogation, uh, dad was trying to lie to his captors, trying to hold back as much information as possible, trying to mislead them any way he could. But then after seven days uh, in Lubyanka going through the interrogations, 
16-hour days, bright spotlight, grueling questions, threats of death, um, uh, dad gets confounded uh, with the press. On May 7th, uh, the KGB guard in charge of the interrogations rushes into the interrogation chamber. He has a copy of the New York Times. He shoves it in my dad's face, yells at him, you've lied to us. You told us you were trained in Arizona. Well, the New York Times says you were trained in Nevada at Area 51. You might as well tell us everything. We'll get it out of your American press anyways. So all of a sudden, for the next thirty day, uh, 90 days of interrogations, my dad does the following. He tells the full truth when he knows they can verify the information in the press. It helps to give him credibility. Yeah. He lies to them outright when he knows there's no way they can find out the answer. Names of pilots, number of missions, specifications about the equipment on board. Then he gives a part truth, a part lie, dances around the subject when he knows that they know something about the question they're asking, but not enough to contradict his answer, such as the altitude he was flying. Yeah. Dad always maintained that he was at the maximum altitude of 68,000 feet when he was shot down. And he did that to keep other pilots out of harm's way because they were flying higher. Yeah. And also to try to get a message back home to the CIA, hey, guys, I'm not telling the full truth. And that was eventually discovered when dad was brought back home and debriefed. Right. Right. Okay. And so uh, how, how long is it after his interrogation that he's, he's brought to trial? He has three months of interrogations of, from approximately May uh, 2nd, uh, 1960 to August 17th, uh, August 15th, 1960. He's then on trial at the Hall of Columns, downtown Moscow. Uh, international audience of press reporters and spectators are in the auditorium. Uh, there's a three panel judge, uh, judges that review the case. Uh, the prosecutor and the, the defense attorney uh, seem to be working together. Uh, the defense uh, of my father, my father's uh, legal counsel appointed to him by the Soviets, not once subjected to any questioning, did not once subjected to any uh, type of uh, 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 a situation that uh, appeared before the docket. So uh, basically, we believe they were in cahoots and that the outcome of a 10-year sentence uh, was preordained. Uh, Dad gets sentenced to 10 years in prison. He serves a total of uh, 21 months in captivity before being exchanged for Soviet spy Rudolf Abel. Right. And how how was he treated in prison? Was he sentenced to hard labor or what what exactly was his sentence? Yeah, the, the exact sentence was three years in a prison facility and the next seven in a labor camp. Uh, but dad only served a total of 21 months, almost two years. Uh, so right. did not go to the hard labor camp. Okay. And, and when did he become aware he was going to be exchanged? Was that just somebody opening a door one day and saying, right, we're moving you out? Well, um, for many, many years, I thought that my dad did not know that he was going to be exchanged. But then I came across um, a letter that my grandfather wrote to my dad in prison. And this was written on or about uh, June 1961. So a year and a couple, a year and a month after the shoot down. Mm -hmm. And in it, this is what the, my, my grandfather writes to my dad. Dear son, in answer to your 16th letter, mom told you she had just got home from her third trip to the hospital. She is much better now. She has had much better breathing this time than other times. We don't know how long till she has to go back with another spell. We hope not for a long time. I could not find out what was discussed at the Khrushchev Kennedy meeting June 3rd, but I did have a call from blank, a lawyer in New York. He is in touch with blank in East Germany and blank is working for a release from that end and blank this end. Just how much good it will do is yet to be seen. I want you to take care of your health and, uh, and yourself above all things. I was told that I would receive a letter from East Germany. I have not received it yet, but soon will. I blocked out a few names that I didn't want to mention in this letter. Will later on. 
we'll have all day, all our hay up first cutting three acres of corn and we'll seed three acres rye. This fall have eight head of kettle to bring calves this year, November or December. We'll close for the time. We are still doing our best to help you. We'll continue your pop. And what I discovered with this is that my grandfather had intentionally blacked out these certain names. And when I held it up to the light, like I'm sure my dad did, um, I could read that my grandfather was talking with Donovan, James Donovan, yeah. uh, with uh, the uh, 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 East German wife of the Soviet spy. And they were trying to arrange this behind the scenes exchange. So I found out that my grandfather was meddling in, in the government's affairs. Dad, my grandfather was, was trying uh, to do anything he could to get the release of my uh, father, of his son. Yeah. And um, so he writes a letter to Khrushchev. He writes letters to Jonathan and uh, Rudolf Abel. He tries to uh, get this, um, the gears in motion. And sure enough, he does help put uh, the government on that path. As a result of my grandfather's meddling, uh, two guys in suits show up to the family shoe store in Norton, Virginia. Mr. Powers, please don't meddle in our affairs. <laughs> uh, you could make it much worse for your son by writing to Rudolf Abel and to Premier Khrushchev and to Donovan. Please don't meddle in our affairs. We will take it from here. Right. And sure enough, they did. Yeah. They contracted with Donovan. Donovan brokers in exchange for the Soviet spy with my father. Uh, and as a result, uh, dad gets exchanged at the Glenacre Bridge in 1962. Yeah. But it all comes back that dad did know about a potential for being released as early as 1961. Wow. Um, but um, up until he was actually exchanged in February of 62, it was just, he didn't know when it would yeah. take place. It was yeah. done and then he was uh, scuttled over. There was no yeah. advanced warning. Yeah, but at least he knew that, you know, people were trying to, uh, you know, get him freed, I guess. Right. Yeah, um, people were working on his behalf. Yeah. What What was his recollection of the swap on Glenica Bridge? And, and how that um, worked and, you know, and seeing Abel cross over as well. Right. Uh, he didn't know who was on the other side of the bridge until after he was freed. Yeah. Um, and he knew that there was, you know, people, Americans over there. He recognized one or two from his uh, uh, unit. Um, but um, he was on the Glenacre Bridge. It's, it's uh, you know, five, six in the morning. It's cold, dark and foggy. It's, it's German shepherd patrols, guard boat patrols, you know, right out of a John yeah. Le Carré novel. And, um, so my dad's on the one side of the bridge, there's a delay. Yeah. And, you know, my dad is thinking to himself, I'm not going back to prison. Yeah. Um, had something gone wrong, had the exchange been called off, had, uh, he's been told to turn around and start walking back to the East. My father had made up his mind. He was going over the edge. He was taking his chances. He was diving. He was not diving into the river. He was not going to be going back to prison. But fortunately, none of that played out. The exchange worked out without a hitch. Uh, Rudolf Abel went home to the Soviet Union. My father came home to America. And one other uh, gentleman, uh, Frederick Pryor, an, East, uh, a, a, an American student held in East Germany, was also exchanged at the same time, but at a different location. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, um, you know, some of these events are portrayed in the movie Bridge of Spies. How accurate would you say that movie is in terms of the story of your your father right well um the big picture of the movie is historically accurate uh, spielberg uh, did a great job of uh, capturing the tensions and the fear of the soviets the a surprise attack uh, the fear of a nuclear war the tensions that were between the east and the west at the time very very well portrayed Mm -hmm. What happens with the East German citizens trying to escape up over the wall being shot very accurately portrayed uh, the duck and cover drills uh, and the fear and the paranoia in America very accurately portrayed. But now the details of each scene, it's Hollywood. They do embellishing. They do dramatic effect. They take artistic liberties. So while the big picture is historically accurate, the details of each scene are not 100 percent correct. I'm going to point out two. One is in regards to the uh, the so the poison tipped pin that I referenced earlier. Mm -hmm. It was concealed in a hollowed out silver dollar, 
And my father, after being shot down, parachuting to the ground, throws the dollar away because he thinks it's the first item some Russian's going to want as a souvenir. Yeah. He takes the pin out. He puts it in his flight suit pocket. The Soviets uh, strip search him. On the third strip search, they find the device. Um, and when my father knows uh, that he, they found it, he goes, oh, be very careful. He did not want to have a murder conviction on top of an espionage conviction, no. already in enough trouble. Yeah, yeah. In the movie, um, the Soviets have the dollar and they're exploiting it uh, with my father, basically saying, look, Gary, look what the American government wanted you to do. Look what they give you. And so that's not 100 percent accurate. They didn't have the dollar. Uh, in addition, uh, the briefing scene uh, when the uh, CIA guy is briefing the pilots in the movie, yeah. it basically implies spend the dollar, use the dollar if you're going down, if you're getting caught. Yeah. Um, but again, that's not a historically accurate. There was no orders to take or to use. Okay. Um, when your father arrived back in the U.S., it sounds like he wasn't treated as a hero. Um, well, that's correct in some circles. Yeah. Uh, some uh, Americans thought he was a hero to our country. Rah, rah, Gary Powers, go, go, go. Other people thought he was less than a hero for having lived through it, for embarrassing a United States president, uh, for, quote, unquote, collaborating uh, with the enemy or spilling his guts. Um, while my father was incarcerated in the Soviet Union for those 21 months, uh, there was numerous press that was released, editorials written, experts, quote unquote, generals and politicians talking to the media about things they really didn't know anything about. Sounds familiar, huh? Yeah. Um, and as, as a result, uh, to my dad's detriment. So the misinformation tarnished my dad's reputation because of the time period. It's the Cold War. It's right off the McCarthy era. It's the fear of Soviet spies in America, fear of people defecting, uh, people, um, uh, 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 the paranoia of the time. So that heightened anxiety uh, was detrimental to my father's reputation in the 60s because he wasn't able to defend himself. All mm -hmm. these editorials were written around the world. Uh, and then when he gets back home, he's debriefed. He's exonerated by the uh, U.S. Senate of any wrongdoing. He's cleared by the CIA. Uh, but still, the reputation, the rumors are circulating around, and uh, more people believe the misinformation, the fake news of the time, yeah. than they did the truth. Yeah. So, um, because he was still effectively working for this, or, or he was working for this civilian organization, he didn't receive any medals. Um, in, in the early years, in the 60s, that is correct, but I have yeah. to clarify the CIA did award him uh, the Intelligence Star for Valor in 1965 uh, under John McCone. Uh, his medal was delayed by about two years from being presented to him. Uh, it turns out that John McCone had a grudge against my father, uh, thought he should have not, uh, um, for lack of a better word, he should have died, mm. um, and uh, was trying to prove that dad had collaborated with the enemy. It was the pilot's fault. Well, turned out it wasn't the pilot's fault. John McCone had to eat crow and dad's medal was delayed by two years because of it. Okay. And he, he then subsequent, subsequently received further decorations posthumously, didn't he? Correct. That is correct. Uh, after about 40 years, 38 years, uh, the 1998, the CIA and the U.S. Air Force hosted a declassification conference in Washington, D.C. As a result of that declassification conference on the U-2 program, it was shown that my uh, father was shot down uh, by the near miss of an SA-2 missile at 70,500 feet, that he followed orders, he didn't uh, reveal any sense of information, uh, he did everything he was supposed to do under the circumstances he found himself in. Um, once that was declassified, that opened up the uh, door for my father to be awarded posthumously because of the military connection with the program. He was still an active military at the time, it turned out. And that allowed him to receive posthumously in, 19, in 2000, May 1st of 2000, the 40th anniversary. Dad was posthumously awarded with the POW Medal, Prisoner of War, yeah. uh, the Distinguished Flying Cross, as well as a special medal from the then director of the CIA, George Tennant the Director's Medal for Extreme Fidelity and Courage in Line of Duty. 
And as a family, we were very honored and very humbled to know that the CIA and the Air Force, after, what, 40 years, stepped up to the plate and helped to set the record straight. Yeah. Uh, in addition, in June 2012, six years ago, Dad was posthumously awarded by the U.S. Air Force with a Silver Star. So the Powers family is very thankful to our government for helping to set the record straight and helping to honor dad um, uh, in, in a way that is fitting for his service to the country at the time. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And w- what's your most powerful memory of your father whilst he was still alive? I remember dad as a dad. Um, yeah. I remember the scruff of his beard when he kissed me goodnight and tucked me in. I remember playing with him. I remember him teaching me to shoot a, a twenty two. I remember him teaching me to fish. I remember him going on bike rides with him and hiking with him. Uh, I remember uh, uh, flying with my father when he was flying for radio and television stations as his career in the L.A. basin. Hmm. So it, it, for me, it was a normal childhood. Yeah, dad was a pilot and got to fly with him. That was really cool. Um, but this extra stuff about his previous adventures with the military and the CIA and the imprisonment, it, it, it was, I was a kid. I was more yeah. interested in playing and doing other things than, oh, talking to dad about what he did 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, you know, my father is 94 now and he's a Normandy veteran. And I'm, oh wow, you know, um, make make made sure that, or making sure that, you know, he's, uh, you know, telling me his stories and and stuff like that. But I appreciate that the because what I wanted to know is sort of understand a bit more about Gary Powers as the the father and the the man rather than this sort of, um, you know, what what you see in the films and stuff like that. Right. Well, no, Dad was a a normal everyday guy. He grew up in the depression in, in the Appalachian section of Southwest Virginia, the impoverished. Um, he was the first of his family to go to college. Um, he wanted to fly from a very young age, always had that desire, that passion to be a pilot. He enlisted in the air force. He followed his dreams. Um, when he gets back home uh, and after the controversy dies down a little bit, I mean, he still has to um, uh, get a job and work and sustain his, uh, his uh, life and all. Mm-hmm. He ends up being a test pilot with Lockheed for some seven years. Um, he writes a book about his experiences. He ends up getting a job with uh, radio and television stations as a pilot uh, covering news, weather and traffic for the evening news or the radio station broadcasts. And uh, so that's how I know him growing up. He's a pilot. I didn't know him as a military person. Um, And so it it was a normal life. I mean, some of my friends were, their dads were plumbers or doctors or lawyers or tradesmen or other pilots. Uh, So dad was a pilot. I had some friends whose dad flew. I had other friends whose dad didn't. It was just a normal childhood for me growing up. Yeah. Up until he passed away. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I wanted to talk about the the Cold War Museum that you set up. Can you tell us uh, something about it? Oh, sure. Well, the Cold War uh, Museum was founded in 1996 to honor veterans, Cold War veterans, preserve Cold War history, educate kids about this time period. What I found out in the early 90s uh, when I was giving lectures on the U-2 incident is that uh, nine times out of ten, the kids would equate the U-2 incident to something with the U2 rock band. They really didn't understand what the Cold War was or what the U2 incident was. So I found that there was this need to educate kids on this time period. That was the catalyst for the creation of the Cold War Museum. Uh, What I thought would take three years to build, $3 million to fundraise, ended up taking 15 years to get brick and mortar. And in that 15-year time period, the museum started to collect Cold War artifacts. As a result, we have a substantial collection uh, of artifacts from the East Germany, West Germany, the Soviet Union, America, South American and African countries, Cuba, Middle Eastern countries, Eastern European countries that were involved in the Cold War. Uh, Flags, banners, regalia, uniforms, some weapons. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've got the largest collection of civil defense items in America, having saved and salvaged the civil defense headquarters for Washington, D.C. We've got uh, a Cuban Missile Crisis display. 
uh, that can be loaned out to institutions. We have a mobile uh, U2 incident exhibit that is currently displayed at the SAC Museum, SAC, Strategic yeah. Air Command, in uh, Nebraska. Uh, we've got items on loan to various museums around the country. Uh, we do uh, different uh, educational um, activities there at the museum for school groups. Uh, we are opened on the weekends, midweek by appointment, staffed by volunteers. One uh, paid staff, the executive director, runs the operation. And uh, more information online, coldwar.org. What, what would you say are the prime exhibits or the, the pride of the collection there? Oh, there's a lot of pride in the museum. A lot of wonderful, very unique and, and rare artifacts. Um, we have items given to us by the crew members of the USS Liberty incident, the USS Pueblo incident. We have items from members who worked on the following programs, uh, the SR-71, the U-2, Corona, KH spy satellite programs. We have items from them. We have a, a very unique item, a, a mailbox used by Soviet spy uh, 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 Aldrich Ames. Uh, he would use the mailbox, draw a piece of uh, chalk, a chalk mark across the mailbox. That would be his signal that he was ready for a drop-off or a pickup. So we have that mailbox that he used to contact his Soviet handlers. Right. We've got a Stasi prison door, an uh, infamous Hoshenhausen, the U-boat prison as it was known because it was underground in East Berlin. Uh, one of our supporters is a former uh, uh, prisoner from that facility. He was able to arrange a prison door and a cot uh, that was used in prison yeah. uh, for display here at the museum. But um, what are the, some of the other items we have? Of uh, uh, Boy, I know I'm missing a lot of stuff. Um, we have an SA-2 missile that was used uh, uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis that we have in our collection. We got from a, um, a surplus. We were able to get the items from the 1980 Olympics uh, versus the Soviets, the Americans, the hockey team, the Miracle on Ice. We've got items from... Um, uh, the Bay of Pigs, uh, a piece of the U-2 that was shot down over Cuba uh, on October 27 to 62 during the Bay of Pigs. We have uh, some other Cold War shoot-down relics, uh, pieces of planes, uh, orders, uniforms, things like that. So it, it's quite a very unique and eclectic collection of Cold War artifacts, ranging from 1945 to 1991. Right. And where is it located? Uh, the museum is located at Vint Hill, Virginia. Vint Hill is a former Army communication base, a listening post used by NSA and CIA, D, uh, um, uh, of ASA, to monitor the embassy communications electronically. It was a functional listening base during the Cold War. It was closed in the mid-90s, and now it's homes and apartments and, and a theater and the museum, a brewery, a winery. Yeah. FAA has a hub, some government contractors in the area. Uh, it's being redeveloped as we speak. Oh, okay. You're probably listening in on the Brits at that point as well. They probably are. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're from overseas, they definitely are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, thank you. That sounds like a great a great place to visit. So uh, if I'm ever in that area, um, yes. I, will, I will... And, and just, to, oh, just for clarification, uh, the museum is located in Vint Hill, Virginia, which is 45 miles west of Washington, D.C. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so um, what, what I normally do with my guests is I have a bit of a, a quick fire round uh, where it's, uh, well, it, you know, it, it's various things. So, for example, the, the first question I ask is, is what would be your favorite Cold War themed or Cold War era film? Uh, my favorite Cold War era film, other than Bridge of Spies. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, um, I wasn't sure whether you'd choose that one if you thought they, were, they took some... Yeah, uh, no, I mean, I, I, was te- <laughs> so I was a technical consultant on the movie. I really enjoyed the movie. I think it was very well done. Uh, he, they honor my father in the end as a hero to our country. I mean, I can't complain. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, that's, that's because it was about dad. Um, uh, but no, uh, Dr. Strange, uh, love. Uh, it was great. Uh, Cold War themed movie. Um, yeah. The Bond movies I love with that intrigue, espionage, and, and all that. Yeah. Um, there's a favorite few more Bond? that. 
Who was your favorite Bond? I have to. Oh, oh, oh! I, I, um, uh, I like uh, Sean Connery is is my favorite Bond. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm old school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I yeah. watched growing up as a as a youth. Yeah. Um. Uh, there's another movie or two, um, uh, and I don't know the title. I'll think of it in just a second. It's like uh, Doomsday or um, a film of The Day After. And it was what happened after the day after a nuclear bomb had, yeah. a war had started, a nuclear bomb had been dropped. And that is a fascinating look at that Cold War era. That film had a very uh, big impact on Ronald Reagan and his views on nuclear war. Ah, I wouldn't doubt it. Um, because I was interviewing uh, Francesca Akhtar, who's done uh, studies on the Abel Archer exercise that almost set off nuclear war in 1983. Right. And she'd also studied Reagan, and Reagan had written in his diary that watching that film had, you know, changed his view. Um, right, yeah, it's a mad, mutually assured destruction. There's no winner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Sorry, I interrupted you. So were, were, were oh, there no, any, any other films? Or, um, I mean, I'm sure there are some others that I really enjoyed, but I'm not, they're not coming to my yeah. mind right now. No, that's fine. That's fine. So if, if you were making a film about the Cold War, what piece of music would you have as the soundtrack? I would, I would have, to, I don't know what I would use. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's um, a fair enough answer gary you know you you, you know well I, I would have to do a little research and figure out what scenes would call for what type of music to be played i would think that vintage music from that era from the 40s 50s and 60s the top yeah. uh, uh charts at the time um would would do well and also some sp parody ones by spike jones i think it was uh, who would do um, a, a, um, a radio, not radio, uh, music uh, uh, parodies uh, when they drop the bomb and, and other things like that. So I, I would probably do an, a compilation of, of the music of the era with some of the satire music from the same time period. Yeah. Okay. No, that, that, that sounds great. That sounds good. Um, if you could invite three personalities from the Cold War period to have a few drinks with and you know, they can be, you know, alive or dead. Who would they be and what questions would you ask? Who? Oh. <laughs> well, I, I would This is the I last difficult that, one now, uh, Gary. This is the last difficult one. Oh, no, yeah. Sure you. I mean, there's, there's lots of Cold War personalities out there. How do you choose between Stalin and Khrushchev? How do you choose between uh, Reagan and Gorbachev? How do you choose between all the, you know, Bernard Baruch, uh, Baruch uh, who was found uh, coined the term Cold War? Yeah. How do we, how do you, boy, pick three people? Um, well, I would think that I would need to pick um, Stalin. Yeah. Because uh, a one on one conversation with Stalin, who was the epitome of the Soviet Union during the Cold War time period, who made it what it was, I think asking him questions about his overall strategy what he was trying to accomplish, uh, why um, uh, was he paranoid to the point of purges that he did and trying to, without being killed myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're, 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 we're assuming that any of these people have been given a truth serum, so you will yes. absolute <laughs> truth from them. Um, I would also uh, probably want to find out uh, why he decided to uh, go against the secret pact he had with Hitler. Um, uh, or not why he did, but why Hitler, what, what he was thinking when Hitler broke the true the treaty with him, you know, yeah. what, how did that make him feel? What did he do because of it? How, how, what, how did that alter his plans? Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's world war two stuff. That's not cold war stuff. Um, well, I would it's want all linked to, in the end. <laughs> well, yes, it is. You know, um, I'd want to, uh, interview Walter Fortzheimer. Walter Fortzheimer is not a well-known Cold War figure, but was instrumental in the creation and development of the CIA. He was OSS. He was the legal counsel for the CIA at its inception. And he would be a great resource to talk to about the early days of the CIA, the transition from the OSS, why uh, the American government thought it was important to establish this uh, clandestine agency after um, World War II uh, had subsided. Um, yeah, no, another person. He sounds fascinating. So you got one. Yeah, he, he, now. 
Yep. And one more person, a Cold War figure. I would want to talk uh, and interview um, uh, Orson Welles. Uh, and because of his his uh the movies and the radio that he did the the the, the war of the worlds uh, the cold war themes the the, yeah. the tensions that he was bringing to the screen um i think he would have a very good insight into the cold war era based on how he was portraying it in his films and his uh, different media yeah no that would be a good medium. choice that would be a good choice. The Third Man is one of my favourite films. Actually. Yes, exactly. I, was, I, I saw that just a few months ago. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Um, are there any uh, books that you would particularly recommend for anyone interested in your father's story? Uh, for dad's story, let me, well, let me do the general Cold War stuff first. Yeah. Um, there's a book called A Cold War. Um, that is very good, and it was um, uh, by uh, Sir Anthony Isaacs, I want to say. I might be getting his name wrong. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Look. It was written for a uh, a British TV yes, documentary yes, yeah, series. The, 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 yeah, the Ted yeah. Turner series that did the 24-part series. Uh, Sir Anthony Isaacs, I think his name is. That book is a very good overview of the Cold War. Yeah. There's one by John Lewis Gaddis, uh, a uh, Yale professor, the, the expert on the Cold War, wrote a book called The Cold War. Um, those are the two really good books on the overall big picture of it. Mm-hmm. Now you can get into the U2 incident. Um, uh, any, uh, my father's book, of course, his autobiography called Operation Overflight is a very, very good book. It's, it's what his account was. It's his memoirs. Yeah. Um, any book by Chris Pocock, he's the leading, a British guy, leading authority on the U2 program and the U2 incident. Any book by him is really good. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Michael Beschloss, a U.S. presidential historian, wrote a book back in the 80s called uh, May Day, which is a good overview. Um, there's a couple of books that have just recently come out called um, uh, Bridge uh, uh, of Spies by Giles Whittle, a British guy. Yeah, and there's another book called Brotherhood of Spies by Maury Morley. I've forgotten his name, but it's, it's Brotherhood of Spies. Okay, and those books are are good over uh, on the overall uh, of the YouTube program, the YouTube incident. Yeah, now I do got to put a plug in for my book. I have just self published within the last twelve months a book called Letters from a Soviet Prison. It is the personal journal that my father kept while incarcerated and the letters he wrote to family and received from family while in prison. It's from the horse's mouth. It's a very good histography of the U2 incident, my father's involvement, what it was like for him to be incarcerated, the tensions, the fear, the depression, the anxieties that were prison life, and his hope for being exchanged and released. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, I was able to get my father's letters. I was able to transcribe them over many years, and I finally was able to put them in a, in a order that could be legible that would help to uh, dispel the misinformation. In this book, he talks about the U-2 shootdown, the sequence of events, how he bailed out of the plane. He's not lying to himself when he's talking about how, what happened. Yeah. It talks about the, the potential for the exchange with Rudolph Abel. It talks about the trial and his feelings of what was it like to be sentenced to 10 years in prison. Um, so it, it's a very unique history of the U-2 incident in the Cold War time period directly from the Soviet prison. My next book I would recommend, if you want to find out about the, the behind-the-scenes stuff with the U-2 incident and my father and the research I've done the last 25-plus years, mm-hmm. uh, my book is called Spy Pilot. It comes out January of 2019. It's on Amazon right now. You can pre-order. The publisher is Prometheus. And um, it is talking about the transition of my father's reputation from one of infamy in the 1960s to one of an American hero in the 2000s and how that, per, uh, that, tra- that uh, progress happened. Um, I have uncovered numerous um, uh, documents that were once classified through FOIA requests, Freedom of Information requests yeah. that I'm using. I'm using my dad's personal letters and journal to and from his family. I'm using uh, never-before-published interviews that I've conducted with people over the last 20 years that I've been gathering. 
Um, I have uh, gotten uh, information from the Soviet archives, from the American archives, from individuals that were associated with the U2 incident of program. And so it's a very, it, it, it should be the um, um, pinnacle uh, of books on the U2 incident, should be the defining source for what took place. I have compiled this information. I've used my dad's book, but his record stopped in 1970. Yeah. And since 1970, so much more has been declassified. And I found the audio tapes my father recorded when he was working on his book. I found uh, declassified files. I found personal interviews from other players. And I've assembled this into a book that uh, will be the definitive source of the U2 incident and will help set the record straight as to what my father should or should not have done uh, while in, uh, in, in, after being captured. Wow. That sounds like an amazing book. I'll have to uh, put that on my Christmas list. Although if you're publishing it in January, I'll have to wait. Yeah. Um, well, you can pre-order. So yeah, a yeah. surprise gift. Yeah. 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 I'll just have to drop some uh, unsubtle hints to my wife. No problem. Where can people find you online? Um, I can be found online uh, through garypowers.com. But please bear with the website. It's functional, but it's 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 uh, uh, needs to be revamped. Um, I can also be reached through the Cold War Museum website, coldwar.org. Uh, I have a Facebook page um, that you can follow. Uh, it's Francis Gary Powers Jr. And then uh, the best way to reach me uh, would be by uh, email, uh, and that is G Powers Jr. at coldwar.org. Okay. Well, Gary, that, that's all the questions I had. Is there anything else you'd like to uh, share with Cold War Conversations that we've missed? No, not off, not off hand, Ian. This has been a very nice uh, conversation. I've enjoyed talking to you, and I'll look forward to hearing the podcast. Yeah, no, it's been very comprehensive, and I really appreciate your time um, talk, talking to me and talking to us, talking to everybody out there. All right, appreciate it. Oh, okay, bye. all right, bye. I'm sure you found my chat with Gary interesting and are keen to learn more, as well as see details of the Cold War Museum. These can be found in our show notes, which are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 23. If you like what you are listening to, then do join our vibrant Facebook discussion group where there's loads of Cold War information and further discussions with our guests. Just search Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Lastly, do leave reviews with your podcast provider. Thanks to ID007Dougie, who has recently done just that. Thank you very much for listening and supporting the podcast. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing off. (laughs) 